Good morning and grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Trust in the Lord and do good. May the Lord give strength to the people. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. The Lord is our refuge and our strength. Good morning and welcome to worship here at the South Hills Partnership of United Methodist Churches here in Pittsburgh. Um, I'm Pastor Dylan Parson. Um, I'll start us off with a few announcements this morning. Bible study is ongoing Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Um, if you'd like to be involved with that, please contact me or Dave Smoyer um, from Fairhaven United Methodist Church, if you know him. Um, we're doing it via Zoom, so you can stay at home and join in right there. It's worked really well for a lot of people. Um, right now, we have people from all four partnership churches joining us, as well as people from outside the partnership. So you're, of course, welcome to join. Uh, we'll be finishing the book of Ezra this week, uh, the Old Testament book of Ezra, and we're currently discussing what our next book would be. Um, so we're certainly open to suggestions. We've got a couple on the table. Um, if you're interested in, in starting to join us and there's something that you would be particularly interested in, please, by all means, let us know. Uh, prayer calls hosted by Pastor Diane and Pastor Peg Bowman are on Thursdays at 7 p.m. Uh, they've been moved a little bit later um, in recognition of people staying out in the yard and stuff a little more in the summer. Um, contact Pastor Diane to be included there. She'll happily send you an invitation to that Zoom call. You can also join it via telephone. Um, so we're happy to have anyone involved there too. Um, as for sort of upcoming events, I should mention first that Spencer is planning a council meeting on the 25th. Um, Zoom will be available for that as well for those of you who aren't quite comfortable um, going out in public spaces yet. I just got a conference call device that we tried at Hilltop's council meeting the other day. Um, Zoom's been hard without a good speaker, but now it's like you're sitting right there. Um, so we'd be happy to have anyone who'd like to just be uh, digitally involved in the meeting there that way too. Um, Spencer and Carnegie are currently planning to reopen the buildings on June 28th um, with safety procedures in place. So Spencer will be meeting inside. Um, the space will be cleaned and rearranged to keep people, you know, at the proper physical distance and that sort of thing. Um, we'll have adjustments um, by the conference and CDC guidelines to, to make it as safe as possible. Everyone should feel safe coming to church. Um, masks, of course, will be required indoors. Um, Carnegie, on that same day, will begin to host drive-in services, uh, which is kind of an exciting new thing. Um, we're going to be doing it like a drive-in movie theater. We have an FM transmitter, so all you have to do is sit in your car, um, turn the radio to the proper radio station, and you'll be able to hear the service broadcast right into your car. Um, I'm thinking this thing's pretty powerful, so we're probably gonna, you know, catch some people coming by on the parkway too. Um, as for Hilltop and Fairhaven in terms of reopening, they have discerned to wait a little bit longer before deciding to do so. Um, we are pretty early in the green phase. Um, and Hilltop and Fairhaven want to see how that proceeds. Um, they've already planned sanitization procedures and distancing procedures, so whenever they do decide to open, they'll be ready to go, um, but they're going to reevaluate at the end of the month when that might be. And of course, online worship will continue um, in some form or another. Um, unsure yet whether it's going to be a stream like this or whether it'll be a broadcast of an actual church service that is going on um, at one of the partnership churches. But anyone in an at-risk group, whether you're, you've got lung or heart disease, if you're over 65, I'd urge you to feel comfortable um, worshiping at home. Um, don't feel like there's any shame in that. It's a perfectly valid thing to do right now, and that's why we have the Internet and this capability to do this. All right. Um, as we prepare our hearts and minds for worship this morning, um, Aaron Ehrlich from Hilltop United Methodist Church offers us um, an arrangement of How Great Thou Art on the cello. So please listen prayerfully and prepare your hearts to worship God.
thank you to Aaron um, for that gift of music this morning. Um, one of the wonderful things, I think, of doing this service for the whole partnership um, across all four churches is the opportunity to hear um, the talents and the gifts of those from every church. Um, and there are talented, gifted people in each church. Um, it's, it's wonderful to share. If you'll join me now in the opening prayer, which will be on your screen. Through dreams and visions, O God, you broaden the horizon and the hope of your people, that they may discover the meaning of your covenant, even in the midst of trial and exile. Strengthen us in faith this day, and increase the number of those who believe in your word, so that all people may joyfully respond to your call and share in your promises. Amen. Our psalm reading this morning, um, as we pray the words of the psalms, is from Psalm 116, um, which I'll read to you now. Let's lift up your hearts to God. I love the Lord because he hears my requests for mercy. I'll call out to him as long as I live because he listens closely to me. What can I give back to the Lord for all the good things he has done for me? I'll lift up the cup of salvation. I'll call on the Lord's name. I'll keep the promises I made to the Lord in the presence of all God's people. The death of the Lord's faithful was a costly loss in his eyes. Oh yes, Lord, I am definitely your servant. I am your servant and the son of your female servant. You freed me from my chains. So I'll offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving to you, and I'll call on the Lord's name. I'll keep the promises I made to the Lord in the presence of all God's people, in the courtyard of the Lord's house, which is in the center of Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Will you join me now um, as we approach the Lord's throne with the words of this prayer of confession? Most merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners and that proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Glory to God, amen. Um, now we'll move into the prayers of the people um, as we lift up all of our joys, all of, con all of our concerns before God and before one another. Um, I'll leave time as always. If you have any to lift up, please feel free to put them in the comments here on Facebook. Um, you're also welcome to send me them throughout the week. I, I get plenty um, when people call me on the phone. People send me emails. Um, the prayer chains through the various churches, Fairhaven and Carnegie in particular. Um, these are churches that are very active in praying for one another. So rest assured that if there's something you want us all to pray for, we certainly will. What do we have today? Um, I'll give you time to put them in there. Um, and in the meantime, I will read some of those that I've gotten this week. Um, first, we lift up Tracy Bell. Um, she just broke her ankle um, after just a few days at work, back at work after the coronavirus. Um, regulations have been lifted up. She works at a daycare, so having a broken ankle makes that very hard to proceed. So we ask your healing. We ask God's healing and God's peace upon her. Um, she especially is in need of prayer because a friend of her son's, Edgar is his name, um, was shot and killed in the in the um, Mount Washington area last night, uh, a few nights ago. So we certainly uh, ask for prayers for Edgar, his family, um, and for Tracy. We lift up the family of Lois Barber. Um, Lois is a longtime member of Spencer United Methodist Church. She lived right near the church. Um, she passed away just last week. Um, I had seen her in April, and she was doing well. 
she declined relatively quickly, um, moving into the hospital and then finally to St. Norbert's. Um, but I spoke to her son yesterday, Jim, um, and they're at peace. Um, but we still ask for God's blessing and God's warmth and sur to surround them. Darlene Yi, um, a former member of Carnegie Church, has been moved into an assisted living facility. Um, so we pray God's blessings on her in this time of transition. Um, Kelly Stasek is getting a knee replacement this week. So let's surround Kelly with all of our prayers, as well as her sister, Kathy Prince, who continues to um, be treated for brain cancer. What else? Um, Charterney, um, her niece, Deneen, is in hospice care at home. And her sister, Donna, um, suffers from breast, breast cancer and is being treated for that as well. Um, I would also ask for prayers. Um, I have a few pastor friends um, out of the state um, that co-pastor a large church in the South. They have a Confederate monument that was put up right in front of their church years ago, but is not does not belong to the church. And they're asking the city and asking um, the organization that owns it to move it because it's been damaging to their witness. Um, particularly this past year, but over the past number of years, um, it's been damaging for their Christian witness to have the statue there. And they are approaching the city, approaching the place that they live with bravery to ask that it simply be taken somewhere else because it's incompatible with the gospel of Jesus. So I pray for them in this very difficult time. Um, I see some other ones here. Shadia's birthday was yesterday. Um, we lift up Nick who is beginning immunotherapy soon. Um, Rich Good is having is having a heart valve replacement on Thursday. And then, what am I seeing from Amanda here? Ah, oh, Amanda Grubbs' grandparents who might have been exposed to the coronavirus. Um, and Amanda and Matt just celebrated seven years of marriage. Dave Sheridan's daughter-in-law, Kim, is recovering from a colon operation, so we pray for Kim as well. And finally, I think I would mention also um, that Steph Bruner, who is Jim and Elaine Campana's daughter, has given birth to a son um, just a little bit early. His name is Calvin, just a little ways under seven pounds born the other day. So we lift up um, our thanks to God for new birth and for birthdays. All right. Seeing no more. Let's go to God in prayer. Oh God, our Father, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together, separate but together, to join in praise, to join in worship, to join in lifting up our hearts to you. As we say, as we gather around the communion table, Lord. It is a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you. And so we do, for all of the good things in our lives, big and small, the good things in this world. We thank you for the beauty, the wonder, the joy of new birth. For baby Calvin, you helped him to be born safely and healthy. You helped his mom make it through, and we give you thanks for that. We lift up those whom we love and celebrate as we remember their birth, Shadia, and for all those who have celebrated a birthday in the last week. We thank you for the gift of each blessed person, blessed friend, blessed family member in our lives. At the same time, we ask that you look upon us with compassion, that you intervene and that you heal, that as you are making all things new, O oh God, you'd hurry up just a little bit sometimes. We feel the weight of a broken world upon us, the weight of fear, the weight of doubt. 
even now as we sit home, still responding to this pandemic that we've lived in for months. Help us, Lord, to be wise as we approach the question of reopening at all four churches and throughout our state, throughout our country, throughout the world, Lord. Help us not to do it with, with hubris or with arrogance, but help us to be wise. Help us constantly to keep in mind the most vulnerable among us and what we can do to keep them safe. Lord, even if we are not scared, Help us to care deeply about any of us who are the most in danger. Lord, we need your help and your intervention in so many different ways. In moments of deep pain, like in the murder of Edgar, we ask for your justice. We ask for your peace. We ask that somehow something good can emerge out of this senseless loss of a beautiful 23-year-old life. We thank you for the gift of this young man and we lament his death. We pray prayers of healing your healing over Tracy, over Kathy Prince, over Donna. And we pray prayers of peace and comfort over Darlene Yi, the family of Lois Barber as you take her into your arms, and over Deneen. Lord, we lift up all of those who have to make hard decisions but right decisions. I pray for my friends, those pastors, that they be strengthened as they make hard and unpopular decisions for the sake of your gospel. We pray for this world, for this country, where for so many justice can still not be had. We woke up this morning again, Lord, to the news of the shooting of another young man, Richard Brooks in Atlanta. We pray for peace, pray for the end of racism and white supremacy. We pray for the city of Atlanta and for black people who live in fear of the reality of injustice and of risk to, the, to their lives every day. Grant us peace, grant us justice, grant them both together because they can never be separated. But Father, you have such great promises for us. From the very beginning, you blessed your people to be a blessing to all the world. Help us to continue to live out the commission that you gave to Abraham and that Christ gave to his disciples to go out to proclaim the gospel, to make disciples of Jesus Christ through us, through the power of your Holy Spirit. Help to make this world every day more and more in the image of of the kingdom that you call us towards and remake our souls that whenever the world sees our face they see your face help us O oh god be with us this day and fill us with the confidence of children of god as we pray the prayer that your son Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Okay. At this time, um, let's pray um, that the scriptures be opened before us, that our hearts be opened, that our minds be opened to receive the scriptures and the word from God, whatever God has to say for us today. Join me in praying. Dear God, open our minds, open our hearts, that as your word is read, and as your word is proclaimed, that we may see you more clearly, and seeing you, that we walk with you, that we walk with you toward the kingdom, toward the redemption of all the world. Speak through me or in spite of me, O Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Old Testament reading for this morning um, is from the book of Genesis, beginning with chapter 18 and then concluding with a bit of chapter 21. Hear now the word of God. The Lord appeared to Abraham at the Oaks of Mamre, while he sat at the entrance of his tent in the day's heat. He looked up and suddenly saw three men standing near him. As soon as he saw them, he ran from his tent entrance to greet them and bowed deeply. He said, Sirs, if you would be so kind, don't just pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought so you may wash your feet and refresh yourselves under the tree. Let me offer you a little bread so that you will feel stronger. Let me put the scripture up here. (laughs) There we go. Let me offer you a little bread so that you will feel stronger. And after that, you may leave your servant and go on your way, since you have visited your servant. They responded, fine, do just as you have said. So Abraham hurried to Sarah at his tent and said, Hurry, knead three seahs of the finest flour, and make some baked goods. Abraham ran to the cattle, took a healthy young calf, and gave it to a young servant, who prepared it quickly. Then Abraham took butter, milk, and the calf that had been prepared, put the food in front of them, and stood under the tree near them as they ate. They said to him, Where's your wife, Sarah? And he said, Right here in the tent. Then one of the men said, I will definitely return to you about this time next year. Then your wife, Sarah, will have a son. Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were both very old. Sarah was no longer menstruating. So Sarah laughed to herself, thinking, I'm no longer able to have children, and my husband is old. The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Me give birth at my age? Is anything too difficult for the Lord? When I return to you about this time next year, Sarah will have a son. Sarah lied and said, I didn't laugh because she was frightened. But he said, No, you laughed. The Lord was attentive to Sarah, just as he had said. And the Lord carried out just what he had promised her. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son for Abraham when he was very old, at the very time God had told him. Abraham named his son, the one that Sarah bore him, Isaac. Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, just as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born. Sarah said, God has given me laughter. Everyone who hears about it will laugh with me. She said, who could have told Abraham that Sarah would, have, would nurse sons? But now I've given birth to a son when he was old. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Our New Testament reading this morning is from the book of Romans, Paul's letter to the Romans. It's chapter 5, verses 1 through 8. Therefore, since we have been made righteous through his faithfulness, we have peace with our God through Jesus Christ. We have access by faith into this grace in which we stand through him, and we boast in the hope of God's glory. But not only that, we even take pride in our problems because we know that the trouble produces endurance. Endurance produces character, and character produces hope. This hope doesn't put us to shame because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. 
while we were still weak. At the right moment, Christ died for ungodly people. It isn't often that someone will die for a righteous person, though maybe someone might dare to die for a good person. But God shows his love for us because while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This too is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, it's not surprising that the book of Genesis contains some of the most beloved Bible stories for kids. You know, the foundation of countless VBS curriculums, coloring books, nursery wallpapers, so much of it from the book of Genesis. Genesis, in my eyes, is one of a few books in the Bible that would be just beautiful, timeless literature, even if I didn't consider it to be sacred and filled with the word of God. It's just a good book. It's an ancient and profoundly weird book, but it's got a kind of magic to it that captures our imaginations thousands of years later. You've got larger-than-life characters, you have angels in disguise, the occasional giant, and all kinds of dramatic twists and turns. Genesis reads sometimes like a fairy tale, and it's easy to forget that when we get too serious about the Bible and forget to read it with a sense of wonder. The Bible wasn't written, after all, in this difficult King James speak, bound in a dusty cover and left on a fireplace mantle or something like that. That's not how the Bible started. It was just stories about a people and their history with God, with each other, passed down around cook fires and campfires from generation to generation. There's some poetry, there's some history, there's some songs, and yes, even some stunning, some true fairy tales. The story of Abraham and Sarah and the visitors at the Oaks of Mamre is one of the most perfect examples, I think. It starts almost like the opening of a movie, you know. Abraham sits at the entrance of his tent, trying to catch some shade in the heat of a dusty summer. After a morning's work, maybe he nods off as the warmth pulls him into a noon nap. And suddenly the camera flashes to the side, where three men are just standing a few yards away from Abraham as if they just appeared out of thin air. Where did they possibly walk from? And how didn't he see them, Abraham wonders to himself. Did he fall asleep? He didn't think he did. But maybe while sitting in that warm air at the entrance to his tent, he nodded off for just a second. His vision is still a little bit blurry, so maybe he did sleep. So he rubs his eyes really quickly and jumps to his feet to meet them, bowing to the strangers to welcome them to his home. Like any decent man in the Middle East, Abraham is hospitable. He offers them to come and stay and eat, drink, rest. He tells Sarah to quickly bake some stuff for him, bake, bake some cakes, make some baked goods. He tells a servant to slaughter and prepare one of his finest calves. And he brings out milk and curds for them to snack on. He rolls out the red carpet for these strangers. But soon, it becomes clear that these aren't three random guys traveling across the hot, dry Judean wilderness. The way the story is told by the second paragraph in begins to shift in a really strange way if you watch the words carefully. It starts to bounce back and forth between the singular and the plural as it refers to the visitors. And it reminds me as if they're sort of shimmering like a mirage in the heat and it's unclear who and what and how many of them there are. And this isn't some mistake in the translation. No matter what English translation of the Bible you read, you'll find this sort of weird shifting. Because that's how it is in the Hebrew. Where is your wife, Sarah? All of them apparently ask. They ask, the book says. Despite Abraham never introducing her, as far as we know, Sarah's still inside. Sarah's still in the tent. But these strangers ask, where is your wife, Sarah? And then one of the men, just one this time, promises that he will return. And within the year, 91-year-old Sarah will have a son of her own. Sarah, who's still 
sort of hiding back in the tent, bursts out laughing and she has to catch herself. It's a pretty hilarious thing to promise, after all. Sarah knows that she's physically incapable of conceiving a baby, and she's not really confident her husband can pull it off either. Sarah's quite familiar with the state of her own ovaries. She knows that they're long retired. What follows is one of the funniest moments in the Bible to me. So God, Abraham's apparently figured out it's God by now, lowers his eyebrows and asks why Sarah laughed at him. Is it because she thinks God can't do it? Sarah blushes redder than anyone has before and awkwardly lies to God's face. I didn't laugh, she says, either not realizing yet or forgetting that she's literally talking to God. God is not amused. Yes, you did. You laughed. And the scene ends right there. This is comedy. I mean, the Bible starts to feel a lot more human, a lot more relevant, when you see that it isn't just pure, heavy seriousness from end to end, but contains romance, adventure, and yes, even funny stuff like this. We come to the end of the story in chapter 21. Sarah does, indeed, a year later have a son. She names him Isaac because she has a sense of humor about the whole situation, too. Isaac means he laughs. Sarah, of course, still hasn't confessed to laughing, even when God confronted her face to face. God, she says, has given her laughter, but only now, since her son's been born. Not that time that he showed up at the tent. She goes on further as she's talking after the birth, um, poking at Abraham, too. I've given birth to a son when he was old. Not her. She's not the old one. Her husband Abraham is. This is just a, deep full, a deeply joyful story of hope in the middle of hopelessness, of surprise. But maybe it's even something different than that. You know, hopelessness doesn't feel like the word because... It's more like hope in the midst of monotony, of just empty, stagnant satisfaction. Sarah's not particularly hopeless when the men show up at her tent. She's not filled with despair or anything like that. She's just not hoping for anything in particular, let alone a miracle where she becomes the main character. She expects things to remain exactly as they are. And how many of us walk through life that way? How many of us are just simply so caught up in the day-to-day -day struggle, the work to get by that we can't look past tomorrow, that we don't even have a desire to look past tomorrow? How many have simply stopped dreaming of being, of becoming more, of growing into what God calls us to be. The God of Israel, the God of Abraham, the God of Sarah, shows up in the midst of ordinary days, out of the blue, like a group of traveling strangers, and gets in our face and tells us to snap out of it. God has called you, personally, to be a main character in the salvation and redemption of the world. As Paul writes to the Romans, we have been made righteous through Christ's faithfulness, and we can boast in the hope of God's glory, no matter the situation that we face. Jesus died for ungodly people, for weak people, died for us that we might become something more. Your life, like Sarah's, is going somewhere. God has invited you to come along to be a part of it as everything is made new, as God's story for the whole world unfolds, and you're as big a part of it as anyone else. If you extend hospitality to God's presence in your life, you know, rolling out the red carpet like Abraham did, for God himself, and for strangers, for the lost who show up on your doorstep. 
You are bound to hear promises from God that are so grand, so wonderful that they'll make you laugh out loud at simply how impossible they are. Dreams for your life beyond what you'd ever hope for yourself. And like Sarah, maybe a year later, maybe sooner than that, maybe later than that, you'll find yourself looking back, realizing that everything that God said about you was true. And that it's even better than you imagined it would be. Imagine the voice of God coming to you in that moment through a holy and mischievous grin. You laughed. You laughed. But look now. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Join me now in the response to the Word of God, the response to this message of hope that we hear through Abraham, through Sarah, through these visitors in the wilderness. Our response to the Word is often a creed that we affirm what we believe. But somehow, in the, sometimes in the midst of deeply joyful stories, deeply joyful worship, all we can do is praise with worship and with music. So I offer you today, and I'm from Craig Davis, the pianist at Fairhaven United Methodist Church, um, another piece of music. It's an anthem, um, Stand By Me, by Charles Tinley. Hi, Fairhaven friends. It's Craig Davis here, your church pianist. I'm grateful to be in front of you again for another piano music installment in our online church series. I'll leave a lot of the talking to the experts, i.e. the preachers. And I was given a piece by Phil Engel recently, our illustrious choir director, called Stand By Me by, uh, with words and music by Charles A. Tindley. Anyway, I look forward to seeing you all in person soon. Hope you're surviving the shutdown. Okay, I was able to get a haircut today, which was a nice thing, with mask on, of course. But anyway, here is the piece for you now called Stand By Me. Enjoy the rest of your church service and the rest of your day. I look forward to seeing you soon.
thank you, Craig. Uh, it's just a wonderful thing to be able to hear from our musicians again. Um, it'll be a great thing to be joining in worship soon. You hear that piano in person. But this is a truly wonderful thing to be able to share across the partnership. We thank you, Craig, um, for that offering. We thank you, Aaron, for yours earlier. And I give thanks for all of the ways that you have offered of yourselves and of your resources to God and to the church this week. Um, I should mention at the last couple council meetings that I've had, the last two were both Hilltop and Carnegie. Um, this time of pandemic has been, you know, a scary one for many churches. You know, when, as soon as it started, within a couple weeks, there were people saying that some churches probably won't make it through. I mean, there's a lot of churches that are that are on the edge financially um, and in so many other ways that this could be kind of the last, the last shock that they could take. Um, it's been a scary time. But at the last council meeting, um, I heard from Carnegie that their giving has leveled out and is, is in a solid place. So I thank you for your generosity, all of those of you from Carnegie um, and from Hilltop. I just learned recently um, from Jim Schmonk there, the treasurer, that in May, Hilltop had its best month of giving ever. Ever. And so I give my deepest thanks to all of you um, for being joyful givers of your time, of yourselves, of your resources, for allowing the ministry of the church to continue and allowing God to continue to work through us all, even in this difficult time, because God is still working. God is certainly still working. Um, and we're going to hit the ground running when we come back whenever we're back to in-person, whenever ministry is in full swing. But it's in full swing now, as best we can, just in a different way. I give thanks to you. And so I ask that you pray with me this prayer of thanksgiving, asking God to bless all that we offer to him. Almighty God, giver of every good and perfect gift, teach us to render to you all that we have and all that we are that we may praise you not with our lips only, but with our whole lives, turning the duties, the sorrows, and the joys of all our days into a living sacrifice to you, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now at the close of this worship service, as we've drawn close to God in prayer and worship and in hearing the word, I offer you this word of hope, this word of benediction. Go forth into this week in the love of God, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and in the communion of the Holy Spirit, ready to greet whatever visitors show up at your door, ready to laugh with God when God, when God tells you all that he dreams for your life. Go with him. Go with God. Amen.